Okay, I, I don't think we start off. Um, dear colleagues, dear students, dear representatives of the DAD, I'm very happy and feel very privileged to introduce Professor Arjun Abadurai here this morning. I'm even more happy to announce that today's lecture is not a singular event, or should not be a singular event, but that it engages us with at least two future trajectories, so to say with future making, uh, of our Global South Studies Center. On the one hand, Arjun will join the center as an international faculty member for the coming three years. He will be engaged in teaching, graduate training, and research in conjunction with scientists from the center. Together with his wife, Gabi Bokchai, also an anthropologist um, focusing on global cultural flows, um, he will spend some months each year at our center. Uh, his lecture today marks the beginning of this engagement. On the other hand, uh, Arjun's lecture also marks the start of our DAD-funded thematic network, remapping the global south, teaching, researching, and exchanging, which we start uh, together with our partners from China, Argentina, India, and South Africa today. Over the coming four years, historians, anthropologists, geographers, um, sociologists, political scientists, I probably forget some disciplines here, it's fairly interdisciplinary, from Sun Yat-sen University, um, from Guangzhou, from Jawaharlal Nehru University in um, Delhi, the University of the Western Cape, Cape Town, and the Universidad de San Martín, Buenos Aires, um, will jointly work on pertinent questions arising from global, from rapid urbanization moves, from migration and transnational relations, global value chains, social movements and quests for political participation, as well as on claims for the future of jointly managed commons, such as urban greens, heritage sites, and fiercely defended commonly managed forests, pastures, and water resources. Dear Arjun, I could think of nobody better to give the very first lecture within this context, thereby giving our network direction, theoretical perspectives, and reminding its principal investigators about the role of the social sciences within a much larger political context. Let me now say some few words, introductory words, on our guest speaker. Arjun Aparurai was born in Mumbai, India, and educated in India, but then continued uh, his studies in the United States. He was formerly a professor at the University of Chicago, where he received his degrees, MA and PhD degree, in cultural anthropology. After working in Chicago, he spent a brief time at Yale, before then going to the new school university in New York. Currently, he is a faculty member of New York University, um, and this is where he comes from. Some of his most important works, I just mentioned a few uh, of your works. I looked over the very long list yesterday, and I thought, let me just mention a few of them. Of course, all of this is very much known. Worship and Conflict Under Colonial Rule, The Social Life of Things, which has motivated many anthropologists to look again into material culture, Disjuncture and Difference, in the global cultural economy, which opened our eyes for the relevance of globalization in cultural studies, modernity at large, the fear of small numbers, and in 2013, the highly inspiring book, The Future's Cultural Fact, Essays on the Global Condition. Arjun Apadurai is recognized as a major theorist in globalization studies, coming from a theoretical background in critical cultural studies, his work operates within a theoretical framework which assumes an increasingly borderless global economy. It is an ambiguous and fragmented terrain which Arjun describes and is highly insightful in seeing the manifold disjunctures of globalization. Arjun is the co-founder of the academic journal Public Culture, founder of the nonprofit 
Organization Partners for Urban Knowledge Action Research, in Mumbai, co-founder and co-director of interdis the Interdisciplinary Network on Globalization and, and, and. One thing I would like to single out, because I think that that's something you're standing for and which I was uh, enthusiastic about. It's this small network or action group, Bukar, in Mumbai, um, that is of relevance, I think, also for our research context here. Puka takes Mumbai as a laboratory for exploring issues of urbanization. The cater of barefoot researchers, young people who claim a right to do research on their own issues, on their own perspectives for political participation. Um, these barefoot researchers uh, were trained within Puka over a number of years and they have discovered and documented their communities, their aspirations, and their concerns. Research helped them to voice their concerns to the wider world. Using research as a tool for intervention uh, and for transformation, Puka has brought in sharp focus, in a sharp focus on Mumbai as a place that belongs also to, to disenfranchised group. So I, like, I would like to bring some of that spirit also to that research network we are starting this, mor uh, this morning. We are now looking very much forward to your lecture. First of all, I must begin with uh, an apology for the slight delay. Uh, which was owed to some uh, uh, things we were doing just before. So I thank you for your patience. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to say how really honored uh, and delighted I am to be uh, at the University of Cologne, or Köln, uh, and especially to be uh, fortunate to help you start this uh, incredibly exciting activity on uh, the Global South with partners from four institutions, including my own country uh, of origin, India, uh, where I happen to know some of the, the people who are here today and their colleagues in Delhi. But I'm also delighted because I do know some people uh, at uh, UWC and uh, also in Argentina at San Martin. Um, so, uh, and in the case of China, I am not sure that I've known people at Sun Yat-sen, but I certainly know their work, and I know some of their colleagues working in China. So this is a great uh, uh, venture, which I'm uh, very honored to be uh, asked to join in today and also to be part of in the coming few years. And uh, I'm especially thankful to uh, Michael Bolick, Professor Berlick, for uh, having initiated a conversation which has allowed me to come here today and which has opened the doors to a longer term uh, engagement with this project and with related projects with the Department of Anthropology and with other colleagues uh, here uh, in, uh, at the University of Kong. So all this is a source of great uh, delight uh, for me. Uh, when I uh, accepted uh, Michael's kind invitation, I was not entirely sure of the nature of the uh, project or who would be, since I'm an outsider in the audience and what range of people. So I wasn't quite sure what would be the uh, best topic to take up your time on, on this beautiful day when you're inside rather than outside. Uh, so I made a choice. Uh, there were some other possibilities and the, I will be uh, alluding to them here and there and they're reflected in my long-term interest. Uh, but this talk, uh, which is on um, uh, mediation and materiality, is in the general space of uh, your very distinguished forthcoming visitor, whose name is on huge banners, uh, Professor Latour. So I'm kind of, you might say, we say in uh, rock concerts, the kind of advance act. Uh, <laughs> uh, not with his permission, alas. Uh, he may have preferred some other advance act, but he has to take what's there. Uh, so that's the space in which I'm talking, but I hope you will uh, see uh, that though the talk is on mediation, materiality, agency, the boundaries of humanity, uh, that it is 
for in my case, coming out of long-term interests in uh, commodity flows, in global cultural processes, in alternative modernities, uh, and other things which are familiar parts of anthropological terrain and social science terrain for a long time, though today's talk uh, may have a slightly more uh, idiosyncratic uh, angle. But I reassure you that it's not uh, unconnected to those older and broader interests that so many of us uh, share. So I'm going to read, uh, but I will also uh, speak informally because I think my uh, written text is longer than the time available to us, so I'll uh, abbreviate and choose here and there. So let me launch in. Uh, among the critical issues that have emerged in the context of what is sometimes called the new materialisms in science, media, and cultural studies, one is the question of ethics, accountability, normativity, and political critique. The context for this concern is that a variety of thinkers, among whom we might count Bruno Latour, Michel Carlon, Jane Bennett, Isabel Stengers, Donna Haraway, and uh, W.J.T. Mitchell, all with significant debts to Gilles Deleuze and through him to uh, Henri Bergson and Spinoza, have agreed that human beings are not the sole repository <coughs> of agency, intentionality, vitality, and purposiveness. These new materialists or vitalists argue that these qualities are also to be found in many other forms of animal and machinic life that surround us, and many of which we have ourselves created. In one way or another, these thinkers all subscribe to the importance of what Deleuze called assemblages, which are temporary arrangements of many kinds of monads, actants, molecules, and other dynamic individuals. This is a term I'm interested in, I'll say a bit more about in a minute, individuals, in an endless non-hierarchical array of shifting associations of varying degrees of durability. In other words, there are more forms of social life on Earth than we have grown used to imagining. Men, most of these thinkers acknowledge that there is some tension between the physics and metaphysics of most variations of this new materialism and our classical ideas of normativity and political critique. Some proponents of the new materialism have proved deft at sidestepping, postponing, or caricaturing these ethical or political worries about the decentering of humans from the field of agency. Others have been commendably honest and constructive in recognizing that the new materialisms have yet to find a way to engage in ethical or political critique. So in this talk, I developed the outline of what I think is a, a slightly new approach to the problem of mediation, materiality, and the distribution of agency across human and non-human entities, partly through an argument with actor network theory, so-called AMT, as developed by Latour principally. And I contend that the normative paralysis that the new materials, materialism seem to induce can be avoided by moving our focus away from all actants, to use Latour's famous term, to a smaller class of agentive entities that I propose to call Mediants, M E D I A N T E S, little things that mediate. So, this idea is anchored in a different conception of the relationship between mediation and materiality than most other new materialist approaches have offered. Subsequently, I also propose that a selective focus on mediants and not equally on all actants could support a more secure set of normative or critical interventions without reverting to a classic humanist view of the convergence of actor, self, person, subject, and agent, which the new materialisms have rightly done much to dethrone. Let me talk briefly of religion, uh, media, and things. things. 
So a number of important findings have emerged in the past decade about the relationships between religion, media, and materiality as mutually constitutive processes. Dutch anthropologists have been at the center of many of these developments, people like Patricia Speyer, Peter Pels, Birgit Meyer, and Peter van der Veer, among others. Uh, the questions that this new body of work raises and addresses, which also belong to a wider inter interdisciplinary discussion, uh, are connected to developments in science and technology studies, actor network studies, and studies of new media. So there's nothing narrowly anthropological about these questions. Let me indicate the scope of the current debate by uh, pointing out uh, a few uh, markers in the landscape of this wider debate. So we have, for example, uh, W.J. J. T. Mitchell, uh, Tom Mitchell of the University of Chicago's uh, essay and then important book called What Do Pictures Want? And without going into the detail of that, I'll point out that it, it's a very interesting argument which actually says that uh, images, uh, particularly pictures, uh, make their own demands on us. Uh, so there's something in them that uh, has a kind of desire for some kind of interpretation, exercises some force on us. So right away, it moves away from the idea of uh, a kind of traditional ethnography where we decide, we interpret, we have canons and so on and so forth, and suddenly poses this startling idea that the pictures themselves are asking something of us. So, of course, it raises the question, how do pictures ask this? How do we interpret what they're asking? And so on and so forth. But I won't go into that. I just point to, to that. Then we have the idea that we were never modern. That is Latour's way of restating the old anthropological idea about the university, the unity of nature. And that is the center, for example, of Philippe Descola's magnificent new book, Beyond Nature and Culture, 2013 which reminds us of the tradition that began with Emile Durkheim and Marcel Mauss and was brought to a sort of cerebral zenith by Claude Lévi-Strauss. And this tradition was not wrong in its view of the fundamental categories of human thought, but insufficiently radical in its recognition of the widespread and deep importance of relational <coughs> thinking about humanity and the cosmos. And here, uh, uh, I again point just to a part of the landscape that Descola's book is part of a very interesting new uh, burst of energy coming out of anthropology about the man, uh, uh, the relation between humans and non-humans, particularly animals and other natural forces. And uh, the work here involves a lot of people like Viveros de Castro, Nurit Bird David, a uh, number of people all of whom are somehow in the structuralist tradition, but no longer making a simple binary, that there is the Western view and other views, they're creating more complex schemes, uh, for example, saying that totemism, as a way of thinking about the man-animal relationship, is very different from, say, animism, which sees spirit in other things than humans, and that the Western way of organizing what nature is about is not one of two ways, a great binary, but actually one of maybe four ways. And of course, when there are four, it could be six, it could be eight. In other words, there's a lot of ways in which uh, populations around the world, especially small populations, hunter-gatherers, people we used to call primitive, have conceptualized what nature is and what humanity is in that picture. And in this, there are also people like, of course, Marilyn Strathern, and one of my one-time teachers, uh, McKim Marriott, an Indianist, who uh, uh, coined, Marriott did, this idea of individual. That is not individual, but individual, a kind of smaller fluid source of agency, which he says in the Indian world, the Indic world, the caste world, is the dynamic entity that uh, composes bodies, and creates the logic of interaction between different bodies, different castes, different castes and other species and so on and so forth, all in a much more liquid way or a much more volatile way than the standard stratification idea. There are four castes, they are hierarchical, they exercise power, which is not wrong, but which is a bit limited in terms of where is the activity. So if you ask the simple question, say in India, where even today you will see people very concerned about saliva, 
touching saliva and then touching their food and that food touching somebody else's food. And this goes into the whole purity and pollution business and so on and so forth. Very familiar stuff, but makes a lot more sense when you think of these uh, sub-individual energies, individual energies that easily flow from person to saliva, to plate, to dish, to food, to the other person. And similar flows also go on in marriage and sexuality. In short, that it's not individuals in social groups, but something smaller, which is animating the traffic between human beings of different types uh, and other species of being, including foods, plants, animals, and indeed gods. So everybody's in a kind of dynamic flowing relation. Now, again, I'm not pointing to these things as perfect views or as correct in every way, but that they open a slightly different uh, angle on the general problem of what humans are. And in recent work on religion and uh, media, this body of work on relational dynamics, on individualism, on the force that is inside humans as well as non-human things as being much more dynamic, uh, much more unstable, and much more, if you like, molecular than our ideas of this individual and that individual as bounded beings interacting with one another. This opens up to me a new uh, vista on the relationship between uh, mediation and materiality. So this is really what I'm mainly after. What is mediation? What is materiality? That is the central thing I want to keep returning to. So my view of the relationship between mediation and materiality, by the way, uh, before I, uh, I say very briefly what my angle is, I should say that this is this interest in mediation and materiality now is both coming out of religious studies, uh, studies of human and non-human agency, a and &T, etc., religious studies, lots of people are asking similar questions about what is mediation, what is materiality, and there's also, as some of you may know, there's some very active new uh, German media theory associated with people like uh, uh, Bernard Siegert and others, cultural techniques, and so on, which is also trying to reconceive what media is and what materiality is. So there's a rich body of theory, and I'm just trying to intervene and contribute to that set of debates. And my view is something like this, that mediation and materiality cannot be usefully defined except in relation to each other. Mediation as an operation or embodied practice produces materiality as the effect of its operations. Materiality is the site of what mediation as an embodied practice reveals. Thus, speech is the materiality from which language as mediation takes its meaning. Pictures are the, uh, are the materiality uh, from which images as practices of mediation take their meaning. This is Tom Mitchell, etc. The eye and its sensory neural infrastructure is the materiality through which seeing as a practice of mediation takes its effect. Most generally, mediation may be seen as an effect of which some sort of materiality is always the condition of possibility. But this materiality, and this is very important, does not pre-exist mediation any more than speech pre-exists language, pictures pre-exist images, or the eye pre-exists vision. The two sides of this relationship always exist and work together as two sides of the same thing. So, basically, I'm arguing that materiality and mediation co-produce one another. One does not pre-exist, and particularly about materiality, we all have a tendency to see it as somehow already there and then something works on it. And I'm trying to say, no, 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 let us look at these things as always uh, co-productive. And now what I want to do is to uh, take a little bit of time, and I'm going to be quite compressed about this, with two examples, because so far this is fairly uh, abstract or it may seem kind of remote from ethnographic life or our daily experiences, and I'm going to take very two very different examples to tell you why I think it's useful to look at mediation and materiality in this 
co-productive, dialectical, interactive, or simultaneous way. And the first is on the theme, both have something to do, you will see, with housing, but in very different ways. So the first example is about housing and home in uh, the films of the Bollywood, the Bombay-based film industry, in which I've had a long interest, and some of you may have enjoyed its products and productions, uh, especially those of you from India, but I think others as well. So in the rich archive of Bollywood films, of which there are about now between six and 800 a year, and the industry has been going for 60, 70, 80 years, it's a vast archive. So I'm no way talking about all those films or everything about those films. But there is, in the archive of Bollywood films, a particular strand in which the life of the urban poor is a central motif. So you can see this in a Bollywood uh, classic like Avara, which means tramp, uh, Raj Kapoor, 1951, uh, or in the more recent Slumdog Millionaire, very much later five, six, seven years ago, also about slums, housing, and so on. And what I call the dream worlds of these films uh, and the dream worlds of the urban poor are linked by the recurrent themes of corrupt developers, greedy politicians, and frequently the drama of housing, which is also a drama of the streets, since the two are hardly separable in Mumbai slums. So the point is that Bollywood films concern many things, but in recent decades, Mumbai itself is heavily themasized in these films, especially in some of them, the kind of more gritty, noir films. They're not just about the countryside or the nation, they're about the city, and the city often is Mumbai itself. So in one crucial scene that some of you may remember in Slumdog Millionaire, the two brothers at the center of the plot meet on an unfinished high floor of a skyscraper under construction and look down at the ocean of slums beneath them. And one of them remarks that the tall buildings they see have grown right in the heart of the slums where they grew up. And in another of the Mumbai noir films, a corrupt, a corrupt developer builds weak structures, and you can see the relationship to true real news facts, uh, that lead to building collapses and massive injury and death followed by brutal reprisals and uh, reactions. And in these films, the nexus of developers, police officers, politicians, and thugs is ever visible in these noir films centered on Mumbai as a backdrop or as a front. And in these films, uh, we can also see something about which I've written separately, which, which is that the idea of escapism is not exactly right that these films are about crucial urban issues, survival, housing, aspiration, wealth, justice, politics. And I argue elsewhere, and I won't take up much time with this, that these films are a way in which the mass audience, particularly of the urban poor, uh, develop and learn a kind of language also of how to understand this nexus. And th that language also is operated and used by them in ordinary political life and so on. So, the old idea that these films are just entertainment, they take people away from politics, they're depoliticizing, depoliticizing, and so on and so forth, I think is a bit misplaced. Uh, and in these films, uh, housing, as I say, often plays a quite crucial role. The variety of ways in which the semantics of the Hindi word kar I, I should use a board, I should have a pointer, I should have PowerPoint, but I don't, in G-H-A-R is the usual transcription, are played out by Bollywood, reveals the richness of the relationship between hearth, home, family, and native soil in the Bollywood lexicon. The word ghar has all these meanings in Hindi, and the cinematic world takes full advantage of these range, of this range. So, of course, the word ghar, uh, house or home somewhat, uh, is closely connected to the idea of the family, first of all. And everyone knows that family is very crucial in 95% of Bollywood films. And uh, the idea of the house or makan and the home, ghar, are often explicitly contrasted 
with a superior value placed on the idea of home or ghar because of its ties with uh, the family. Family relations are inev inevitably domestic relations, and domestic relations always revolve around marriage, motherhood, and above all, the relationship between mothers and sons. And this has been pointed out many times <coughs> by critics of Bollywood cinema, but they don't notice that house and home are part of it. It's not just family, mother, son, etc. There's a physical architecture to all of this. So at one level, you have family and that level of what house and home means. You also have then, uh, and of course, the poor and the rich are defined often in, these, in this film by their domestic spaces, hovels, huts, streets, palaces, mansions, and the like. But there's always some kind of physical housing in which the action uh, occurs. In the 1990s and in our millennium, since 2000, uh, at another level, the theme of borders, partition, family, love, and separation have also been exploited in numerous bo Bollywood films, most recently by the, and these are examples that some of you may know and some of you may not, by the hugely popular film Veer Zara, 2004, Shah Rukh Khan, Rani Mukherjee, Preeti Zinta, etc. And all these films, of which Veer Zara is one, not on, the only one by any means, make the link between home, house, uh, and uh, home, house, territory, and identity. So it's national, partition, India, Pakistan. But it's always about what in German, the, this idea of Heimat comes in. It's not only the house, but your place, your soil, your territory. And partition is all about the splitting of that. And there's a great film that some of you may have seen from very early 1973, which is called Garam Hawa, Hot Wind or Hot Breeze, which is a great film about a family in North India that gets split by the partition, some of whom then move towards the border and cross, some do not. So it's a great, it's a great film in its own right, but it's also a film simultaneously about family, property, lineage, and breakdown, but also about India as the home of Muslims, not Pakistan, to which some of them then move by identification, say we must move away from this home to that home, therefore partition borders. Garam Hawa really puts in place the fact that home is all these things, works at all these levels. So here, uh, these films, uh, a film like Garam Hawa points out that home is never just shelter. It's far more, and it often has to do not only with territory and identity, but also space. And in the end, I argue this in an, some other work, it's about salvation, soteriology. What will redeem you and save you has something also to do with the dynamics uh, of home. So what does this kind of discussion, which I've given very briefly, tell us about uh, mediation of materiality, my bigger themes? And here I would say it tells us at least three things. First, it tells us that Bollywood films are a technology of religion because they are about salvation and soteriology, though not always about religion proper, not about gods and goddesses, but really about what will save you. So there is a, a kind of uh, these films, I would say, are a technology of religion. And if we agree to see religion, which many uh, of the new scholars of religion and media point out, is primarily what is religion for them? Not gods and goddesses, but a form of mediation between the visible and the invisible. That is a better general definition of religion than gods, goddesses, idols, and so on. Then uh, uh, we could see the invisible order of family, kinship, territory, and belonging can be found in the vis only in the visible order of housing, however insecure, unstable, and temporary such housing might be. So housing is very visible, whether you have it or you don't have it. But these other things are less visible, identity, territory, nationality, and so on. But it is through the visibility of housing, its lack, often, that you can see the invisible. And you can also think about the journey from the visible to the invisible, that is being <laughs> saved and so on and so forth. Uh, so that is one connection. Second, it allows us to see films and film viewing. This is the second way in which mediation and materiality come in. Uh, see these uh, uh, 
films and film viewing as a vital part of Mumbai's infrastructure, which allows uh, ordinary, often poor citizens to communicate and contest messages about the power, wealth, security, and transportation that flow all around them, and that often seem impossible for them to share in, in a just manner. So there is an infrastructure issue going on the whole time and a debate about infrastructure going on. And third, and most important, it allows us to identify through the lens of housing, a linked set of what I call medians among the numerous actants who compose the multiple and shifting assemblages of construction, development, law, finance, and politics that characterize the Mumbai housing scene. These medians, which are not all the actants, include filmmakers, film audiences, developers, real estate brokers, and politicians whose mediant capacities are not simply aggregations of their actual roles in other assemblages in cinema, finance, real estate, uh, crime, and politics, uh, the median role allows us to detach that portion of various human actants that characterizes their shifting and temporary participation in housing-related assemblages, in which the materialities they mediate also involve non-human medians and actants, such as cameras, billboards, cash, cement, construction equipment, water pipes, and electricity lines. These are the non-human medians. And the human medians are the developers, the police, the housing guys, and so on and so forth. These are the non-human and human medians who work together in creating the drama of housing as the visible thing through which you can see a larger invisible order, which is much larger. Uh, and much more abstract, if you like. So, so from a traditional sociological point of view, the idea of the median allows us to foreground the socialities that emerge through specific materialities, such as housing, without ignoring other actants and without insisting on the priority of whole human individuals. So in other words, if you take somebody in finance, or in crime, they do many things. But a piece of them, the median piece, enters into the filmic assemblage of housing. There are other pieces to them. And if you just looked at them as individuals, you get a cruder analysis. Well, there is power, there is crime, and so on and so forth. But to see how these pieces of these actors are assembled in the filmic narrative opens a whole way in which I think we can see the connection between mediation, broadly speaking, through cinema, and materiality, in this case, the reality of housing, its presence, its absence, its significance. So that's one example. Now I move to another example quickly, which is my more recent work, uh, uh, which is uh, this concerns the subprime mortgage crisis in the big financial collapse of 2007-2008 in which uh, a group of colleagues and I have been working together to develop a kind of anthropological analysis, not just of the whole crisis, but actually of the derivative, which is a peculiar, the peculiar financial form, which is traded in the new financial markets that dominate today's world. And many of you probably know something about derivatives, but if you don't, let me just point out that by various calculations, the value of the global market in derivatives trading depending on which analyst you read, is between four and five times the total value of global GDP. That is the value of the derivatives market. It is not small. It is engulfing uh, other measures by a huge proportion. Very important. And to make a long story short, many of you know, and this has been discussed and beautifully written about by other people, the great collapse, the financial collapse of 2007-8, uh, whose results we are still seeing, uh, not only in the US, but in Europe, the whole Greek austerity struggle is incomprehensible outside the terms of the world uh, credit crisis and debt crisis and risk crisis of 07, 08. So it is indeed global and has a lot to do with major global developments. Again, I won't spend a lot of time on them, but its initial site was in the US with huge global echoes and its major expression 
was in what was called the subprime mortgage crisis. Now, there's a lot of analysis of this mortgage crisis in the U.S. and how it precipitated the, uh, uh, the larger collapse. And that larger collapse, of course, played out and affected Europe, but also many other global economies. And actually, its effects are still with us. And one of the great research issues uh, that I am personally interested in, which I hope also this project will take up, is what are these new instruments like derivatives doing in other parts of the world? Because they are huge in directly or indirectly in Brazil, in India, in Russia, in China, in South Africa, and in a host of other smaller places. The global credit market has been unleashed. And in my view, that horse cannot be put back in the barn. There is no going back. You cannot refuse it. Debt refusal, the Occupy movement, bankers are bad, walk away, all true, but completely unrealistic. It is now vital to the global economy. It is completely at play, and no one can turn their back on this new set of financial markets any more they can turn their back on finance or an industry and say, well, look, technology is bad. Let's just not have industry anymore. Like someone like Gandhi said, let's go back to the village and so on. Sorry, great idea, completely impossible. So then the question becomes, is there some way to reorganize it? Otherwise, we are all up shit creek because we know that the, that economy as it's currently working is profoundly exploitative, completely opaque, and run for not just the 1%, but the 1% of the 1%. So we are all finished, unless we find a better way to understand it. That's my larger interest, larger project. But today I'm talking about mediation of materialities with a little take on it. That if you look at this so-called subprime mortgage crisis, let me just give you a very quick uh, uh, a sort of uh, social science or layman's understanding of what subprime mortgages did in this new economy. And though I'll put this in very simple terms, let me say that this simple understanding took me about three or four years of reading a lot of very difficult stuff, but I think I have the idea finally clear. So basically, in the US, you have a very active mortgage market, which is roughly speaking, let's say, at least 100 years old. In other words, you can borrow money, put a down payment, and the bank will give you the rest of money as a loan on which you make payments all your life. That's a simple housing mortgage. That was the good old days. And it was basically one homeowner, one house, one mortgage, one bank. And you pay it out. The idea goes for, say, 25 years. And usually you pay about three times the interest in relation to the principal. So that's where the bank makes the money. And everyone is happy or unhappy. It's the center of the American dream. No a person is considered adult until they are borrowing uh, for housing. Leave aside consumer debt, plastic. That is another whole story. But the housing piece of that is massive. And in the US particularly, less so in Europe noticeably, you're not a proper adult until you become some kind of homeowner. So the home ownership dream is also the dream of adulthood and actually the dream of being a proper American. What happens over those 100 years, but especially in the last 30 or 40, is a series of little innovations begin to happen, the most important of which is that about 30 years ago, some smart fellow in the investment banking business with a particular interest in mortgages said, you know, what if let's say everybody in this room has a mortgage? What if I could slice your mortgage up, each individual mortgage, let's say into 10 pieces? Then I blend all of them. And some of you, let's say in the room, are very unreliable uh, uh, debts. Meaning you don't have much money, but you still have a mortgage. Others are very good. But I slice and dice, this is my favorite word, the mortgage, each mortgage into lots of pieces. The law allows me to do that. I rebundle them. This rebundling takes that commodity, which has already been turned into an asset, which is not the same as a commodity. The asset is the mortgage. Slices and dices the asset. So where there was one asset, there's now 15 assets. Recombines them all of them in this room. So let's say as many people in this room multiplied by, let's say, 10 or 15 pieces per. Then 
the bad parts get combined in a very hard way to recognize from the good parts, the good debts, you get that re-rated and you get the bundle of mortgages, of which there may be many bundles. So let's say there are 100 people here. Let's say there are 10 pieces per mortgage, very simple, 1,000 pieces. I combine them into another 100, but except it's not the first 100. It's completely different scramble and mix. And then I make 20 of them into a bundle, which is a security. Now notice by then you are already, some pieces of you are with some pieces of it. This is where individuality is important. It's a piece of you, a piece of me, and a piece of somebody else with some very bad stuff below, some good stuff above, some A grade, some B grade, some D grade, some F grade, all blended and mixed. And think when this is done with 10,000 and 50,000 mortgages, it takes six months to figure out what is in the blend. Where's the bad part? This takes huge amount of expertise, diligence, and so on. Why is it not exercised? Why it's not exercised is because those securities, those new bundles are being sold very fast with somebody rating them. So we have come a long way from the house. Forget the home. The house has become an abstraction called a mortgage. The mortgage has been sliced and diced. That has been recombined. That has been securitized. And notice that every mortgage and each of the sliced and diced pieces has a future horizon, meaning it has some value in the future. It has some value today, it has some value in the future. And this whole game is about future value. And the trade in derivatives, whether they are housing based or anything based, is always about future value. I say the future value will be X, you say the future will be value will be Y. But let's see if we can do a deal by agreeing that the future value will be something, Z, which is not my price, not your price, but it's a price. Deal done, I sell. When you do all this bundling and sell, I to you, you to another person, it's a hot potato, keep selling. You're not worried that somewhere in there, there's a lot of shit. Because the selling goes on. That is also the reason why hundreds and thousands of banks made terrible loans. Because they knew these loans are going to be sliced, diced, repackaged, resold, resecuritized. And that resecuritizing process in housing, but also in anything else, is what you call derivative. Why? Its value is derived from something else. Let me be more precise. The risk of its future value is based on the another risk, which is the risk of the underlying commodity. The beauty of the derivative is you can do this again and again to eternity. So I have this commodity, then I have an asset based on it, which has a different risk profile in terms of its future value. I sell that to you. You package that again, you sell that to somebody else, the derivative is again abstracted. And then you can keep making new derivatives. This is a very creative area. One of the reasons it's very tough to analyze and handle, and why your colleagues here and elsewhere in the business school, in the finance department, spend a lot of time teaching students what are options and values, what is risk, what is the derivative market, because technically speaking, it's very complicated and it's a pyramid of risk on risk on risk. So let me take one step back to say the key innovation of the financial markets of the last, let's say, since 1970, 73 to be precise, Black-Scholes, those of you who know the name Black-Scholes, created a model for pricing options. Before that, it was a very rough game. Now there's a mathematical model for pricing options and it is the kind of Bible. There's been a lot of revision, tinkering, fiddling, and debate, but it's still the Bible. For derivative traders, they take Black Scholes, take something, plug it in, plug it into the model, the model tells them a price. Now, not everybody complies with that price, they tinker with it, but it's there. This is a market based on a very deep principle, which is a discovery, I would say, of modern finance, wherever you date it, risk itself can be monetized and sold and resold and resold. So you can, it's no longer anything to do with the underlying commodity. Whether it's housing, whether it's cotton, whether it's steel, here's materiality as we used to know it. It's still there, but it's now 10 removes, 15 removes from the instruments that are being sold, which are not based on the raw price of the commodity anymore, but on the commodity's risk profile at some future date. And that date is never abstract. It's always five years. So there are always terms. 
So we have to agree on what will its price be in five years. Of course, I may buy something with a bet on the five-year price, but I may sell it next month. So I'm not waiting and saying, okay, now I'll sit and wait for five years to see whether I was right. No, 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 you'll sell it again. In fact, you might repackage it into another derivative form, etc. This is how you can take a relatively modest stock of commodities, although the global stock of commodities is not modest, and produce from it a mountain of value based on future value, which is five times, six times, eight times the value of the underlying GDP or the underlying commodity, whether it's silver, cotton, steel, doesn't matter. This is pretty magical stuff. But my argument is that it's not actually a racket or a scam. It's not fictitious value, as some people would call it. It's not something ephemeral. It's quite real, but its reality is somewhat abstract. And its relationship to real physical commodities that you can see and touch is uh, very indirect. And it also that core value or floor value, what people like Marx tried to analyze in terms of abstract and relative surplus value and so on, has now through some mysterious uh, mathematical operation, which has to do with future value. So it's not a trick. It does have to do with what will the value be. And everybody knows these values change. So it's not, you know, it's not a trick. The trick is what will the future value be? And the bets on that repeatedly turn into new derivatives can create value way beyond the actual val current value of that stock of commodities or of all commodities. Come back to housing. So in the mortgage crisis, a huge variety of instruments was developed for slicing, dicing, repackaging, resecuritizing, and selling this stuff with the bad stuff, namely bad debt. People who could never repay, who were still given loans, people who $20,000 annual income asked to buy, invited to buy $300,000 homes. That's a shitty loan. Why would a banker make it? Why? Because of this machinery. He's not going to hold that. He's going to feed it into the slice and dice machine, make his money on that derivative sale, move on, move on, move on. AIG, the great insurance giant, in 2008, ended up with a very big bag of bad potatoes. Because that all ends somewhere. They, when the music stopped, everybody was sitting in AIG and a few other companies were standing. And they, of course, got bailed out and so on and so forth. That's another story. So having told you how value is generated in the subprime housing market, notice it's also got to do with housing, home, people's wish to get something very deep and significant to their adulthood. But without their knowledge, they are being individualized, chopped, sliced, diced, repackaged, and resold. That is happening to every American mortgage owner. I discovered this, by the way, personally, when I suddenly found that the bank to which I sent my loan has changed, and changed five times. I thought, what is going on? Why is my loan, which was a Johnny Bank here, going to Jimmy Bank there? Suddenly I learned, no, no, you're part of a huge crowd of lemmings that's been repackaged, tinned, and sold. So you send your check to another place. And I thought, well, that's fine. I just send my check. Then I realized now, years later, what this huge machine was for making money in which, now I'll give you the political economy in one sentence, the upside risk goes to 1%, the downside risk goes to 99%. In other words, when these things collapse, the people doing the trade who also win and lose, but their winning and losing always balances out and they're always, they are making the money, net, net. And the rest who took all the bloody mortgages, many of them which went, as the word goes, underwater, meaning the value was less than what they, they, they had no capacity, but they just walk away. As you many people know, those homes are just abandoned. They just leave the keys and leave. What's the bank going to do? Because there's no point for them being in that home anymore. They can't afford to repay. And the banks, meanwhile, have sold that thing again and again. So that house, empty house, sitting there is only in a very indirect relationship to any particular bank. It's part of some aggregated resource sitting somewhere. Anyway, so the point here with mortgages, with this example about housing and mediation and materiality, is you can see that derivatives trading is a very complicated way in which mediation and materiality co-produce one another. In other words, the original materiality, if you like, of the house, the single home with a single mortgage, has been mediated to produce new orders of materiality, which are then remediated because then trading 
is then a form of mediated activity. I sell this 10,000 pieces of something to you. And that may be an ABS, an asset-backed security, or a CDS, which is my favorite, credit default swap, a word that you may have heard, which is a genius of a formation where I can bet, let's say I am A and somebody is B, I can bet A and B can take a debt, take a bet on the outcome of a trade or agreement between C and D saying C will default, C will not pay, C will walk away. So I can take a bet with you about somebody else defaulting on a deal with somebody else. That is a credit default swap, which is an insane form. But let me tell you, credit default swaps are hugely popular in the global financial markets. And if, for example, in 2011, four years after the collapse, in which credit default swaps were huge culprits in the US, the Reserve Bank in India has opened up the credit default swap trade under pressure from the financial industry with one proviso, they say, no, 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 we will allow credit default swaps because they obviously make so much money, but you must have an underlying interest. You can't just do a deal on somebody else's bet. You must have some investment in it. Well, my prediction is in three years, that constraint will go and the game will be full on with credit default swaps, whose value is something like uh, in, in the trillions already today in the global market. So media mediation materiality again have, if seen as co-productive, in this realm, which is very different from the simple, let's say, housing story in Mumbai cinema, common thing is housing. But here too, you can see that working together, mediation materiality, uh, not only co-produce each other, but in this instance, produce massive amounts of new value through trading on, on risk. So this is example number two. And now let me just take a couple of minutes to draw some uh, conclusions. So one set of conclusions that I want to draw is that uh, the one I already argued that it is not helpful to see materiality, whether in the form of housing or gold or cotton or silver or steel or anything else that we recognize as a material thing conventionally, and to see it as pre-existing and then to see some form of mediation is acting upon it. So my main proposal is these are dynamically co-productive. And I honestly think that if you go back to older commodity traffic, you will also see this. Whether it's the gold trade, the silver trade, the cotton trade, it is always that mediation is co-productive of the materiality itself. You know, the material doesn't pre-exist. Steel as such means nothing. It's always how much, valued how, in what currency, to whom. In other words, there's a vast set of mediating operations already existing, and then that these can be elaborated considerably. So point one, mediation materiality co-produce one another. Point two is that uh, in, this, in, in this way of looking at things, indeed it is not helpful to see human and non-human agencies as being radically separated because agency lies also in these instruments. These instruments also exercise force, like the swinging door in La Tour, or like the train, which is going from here to there. And if you get on the wrong train, sorry, too late. That train has agency. It is going where it's going. You can decide you're on the wrong train. Well, you better get off. There's no discussion because that train, in effect, has agency. These are the normal examples. Of course, there are examples of tons from the sciences, from uh, laboratory studies and so on, that once a germ is going, a virus is going, it's going. And for all practical purposes, it has a map, it has a direction, it has purpose, it has motivation, it has energy, and it has force. So acting like you're in command and those things are just at your disposal makes no sense. They are indeed agentive. But what I'm also saying that with all these agents, or with what I'm calling medians, mediation and the materiality of these medians are always dynamically producing one another. And so when we study mediation, this may be the large, larger message, we want to always ask what materiality on the other side is being produced. Conversely, when we study material flows, 
always pay attention to the mediating logics because they are adding value, producing value, obscuring value, and so on and so forth. Those two messages are important, very important. The last message that I would take from these two examples seen under the rubric of materiality and mediation, because you could study Bollywood films for other reasons, you could study subprime mortgage for other reasons, but I put them under this rubric for this purpose. What I'm trying to also open up is a political terrain. How can we understand these processes in a manner in which we can still exercise normative judgments, still make critiques, still mobilize people, still have a politics without <laughs> claiming we are the main thing. The rest is just inert stuff. Animals, plants, commodities, all that is just stuff. We are the agents. If you don't want to do that and agree this, the rest of the agents are also exercising different forms of agency. They don't have to be human forms, but human forms then become one form of agency among others which many people would agree on. That's not my insight at all, alone, by any means. What are the implications for politics? And the implications for me have something to do with this idea of individuality, that we are not anymore individuals. And many parts of the world, in the anthropology of relation, relationality, we know that humans are not individuals in our modern sense. They are made up of all sorts of shifting substances and flows and energies which assemble with others. If we know all that, what does it have to do with our contemporary condition, with the materialities we live with today, and which say in the case of finance are radically productive of inequality, injustice, exploitation, suffering? What do we do? So one answer is, really, you know, organize or resist or refuse. My answer is slightly different and that is that we need to recognize that we also have been turned largely into individuals. So we live, again, practically speaking, in a world of ratings. We have an academic rating, we have an insurance rating, we have a health rating. We are a large, each of us is a large meeting point of scoring and rating, which is individual, which doesn't have to do with the whole of us. Who cares who is the whole of you? Tell me one person who cares, one institution. Uh, I don't see it. We've been, in other words, radically fragmented, segmented, and so on, largely for the benefit of others. Now, the direction that I see this going in from a political point of view is can we build a politics based on our individuality, not on some idea of individuality which has gone out the door forever? Can we reassemble as classes or institutions, as, as groups? But there the hard work is how do you get to a class, for example, let's say class interest, out of individuals, not individuals? How do you assemble them into some kind of creative political energy that is, there's no off-the-shelf answer to that. But from an intellectual point of view, it means we have to rethink very simple words like group, class, mass, multitude, heart and negri, etc. All of these we have to do the math again because the raw entity under it is not individuals. Let me bring you and me together and thousand of us, we will be a trade union. Bring another thousand, we will be a class. No, no, no. If there are 10,000 of us, little agents who happen to be temporarily clustered in these bodies, how do we assemble those? Now, I would be delighted if I had a good answer to that, but I think uh, it requires both uh, some kind of imaginative work and a new way of redesigning our very primitive, by which I mean our basic social type, science terms about collective behavior, not, have to be revised and rethought. And if we do, I do think some new kinds of politics might emerge and also new ways to, if you like, re-socialize finance, re-appropriate this value which is now being sucked up by 1% of 1%. And uh, finally, I think it opens up a new way or one more angle on South-South or global relations because <laughs> Uh, it opens up a new way of thinking about agency and materiality, which doesn't mean disposing of our older ways, but it means subjecting them to a kind of refinement, 
which I think is a very challenging thing, but I think its payoff is not just kind of intellectual fun, but uh, potentially uh, a, a genuine rethinking of collective politics. So thanks very much. <laughs>